Hey, hey, we're back. We're back on Trek Chat, a podcast brought to you by Trek on the Tube. Uh, I'm here with two good friends, two fellow Trekkies, uh, Starfleet boy. How you doing? Very good. I'm cleaning up a spilled beer, but it's only partially spilled, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the the other guy from the Starfleet Boy podcast, the the one and only Doctor. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing very good. I like the other guy. That's good. I like that. You, you like the other guy? The other guy. Did in, you like that? In movie? real life, the guy? he's the pithy guy. <laughs> yeah, you're the pithy guy. You definitely are the pithy one. It's true. It's casual, informal, and pithy. Should I start saying that? No. no okay. Not. I think casual and informal is a good catchphrase. Yeah. Which is a perfect <laughs> plug for the Starfleet Boy podcast, if you guys want to check that out. Yay, um, thank you. This is a crossover. We're, this is like a, this is like a old Star Trek meets new Star Trek and you, new Star Trek. <laughs> it, it's more crossover than, than you think, because I don't think you guys remember this exactly, but... Um, so the doctor proposed that we talk about this subject, and it was on a Starfleet boy. That's true. So we, were, we were doing a Starfleet boy discussion, and we thought, oh my god, we should talk about this topic. And uh, so here we are. So if you if you guys want to if you guys want to follow continuity and canon, you guys have to check out both both podcasts. They cross over. <laughs> yes, I agree. That's how it works. Um, today we're talking about the future of the future. How do the people <laughs> the in the Star Trek in the twenty third, twenty fourth. 25th century how do they how do they perceive the future how do they view it um in their holodeck programs in their hollow novels in their uh, in their literature and all of this this fantasy or the, the you know all of their in other words what's science fiction like in star trek yeah exactly exactly i want to know what do you guys think there's a line in picard where he doesn't he he kind of he, it's a very, it's very yeah. pithy to to. Oh, he says he says he's not a fan of science fiction. I think I right. loved that. Yeah. I loved it. I loved it so, so much because it's so true. He's never been. Jean Luc is all about Shakespeare, and he quotes Shakespeare all the time. He's a he's a Shakespeare, he's a secret Shakespearean uh, actor. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a Shakespearean actor. But he did have Asimov in his library, so props to that. He tried. Mm-hmm. It was maybe a gift, but of course, <laughs> as, but, but is Asimov <laughs> Data really... gave it to him as a gift, and he never read it. <laughs> is, is Asimov is Asimov science fiction though to Picard at this point? I mean, no, no, right? It, everything Asimov dreamed. Of, that's a great uh, way to start this out. Let's just be clear that Star Trek and the future it depicts for us is everything and beyond what Asimov ever predicted as a futurist, as his futurist part of his his uh, uh, writing career, in my opinion. I think they've now, especially with <laughs> Picard and synths and synthetic bodies and and uh, mind transfers, like these are things that like are extremely way beyond, I think, uh, you know, what Asimov imagined for the future. It's crazy. What about uh, Jules Verne? Jules Verne's. I know. I ne- I'm Vernons. glad you translated it into English. <laughs> what, 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 what about that? Is that just fantasy, basically? Or is it just considered... Uh, maybe it just falls into classic literature, perhaps? Maybe they have, I, like, re- retro, retro sci-fi? Retro sci-fi? I would, say that, yeah. I would say that what we're talking about today would be, uh, like, you know... Yeah, I I would say that Jules Verne would be the grandfather of science fiction, right? Like, isn't he like, isn't he really the first science fiction author? Like, he kind of invented science fiction. H.G. Wells, Jules Verne. Yeah, those guys. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I only had eyes for Jules Verne. (laughs) Oh, can't forget H.G. Wells. Oh, I was going to say Lovecraft is too recent, isn't it? We're going to assume that Jake Sisko writes science fiction, that one of the genres he writes is science fiction so we've got to we've got to talk about what he what would jake Sisko write about the the, the automatic assumption <laughs> well i you know he the thing that love stories you don't know we know well he's he's more of a journalist right yeah he's more like slice of life 
Life Jake on the space there? station. Yeah. But we was he was writing novels. He was a novelist of some sort. I don't remember his I, I like think chosen I think genre. It's like thematically novels about, for example, his life experiences or right. the like the Bajoran experience right. b- being right. under Kardashian right. occupation, maybe that kind of stuff. That's yeah. exactly the bulk of his work but like every author kind of dabbles in another genre like i th- i feel like it's okay like we didn't see the whole library it's possible there's a science fiction novel in there and that's what i want well, to maybe <laughs> i want to imagine what jake cisco is writing about um even though it is good to pay homage to the past we have to imagine the future's future in this podcast don't you think yeah and i think i think it's a, it's a challenge because in Star Trek, we see a lot of the past, especially in the holodecks and all that stuff. So when I think about what is futuristic for people in Star Trek, I keep coming back to time travel. I think, you know, which mm-hmm. goes H.G. Wells, The Time Machine, I believe is still science fiction for most people. Obviously, we, we see time travel in different forms over star trek but it's never it's mostly not never it's mostly but, you know it, it's it's not commonplace it's not like the transporter it's not like uh warp drive it's not you can just casually yeah. time travel to the 18th century um so i think like time, travel, think time travel time travel is not science fiction for star trek people because it's no longer theoretically possible but it's not time, commonplace time tra- that's the, it's not as commonplace as say the warp drive i i think time travel is mm-hmm. not it's not that it's not commonplace it's highly regulated or even outlawed but it exists because we've seen so many examples of it and we've seen more exa- too many examples of it on star trek to say that it's hard to do anymore if you get my meaning hmm like even even in the cage, uh, t- uh, warp was actually f- the full name for warp speed was time warp speed. So he goes, we're entering into time warp. Someone's been watching Cage, but, uh, <laughs> but like, <laughs> yes. But like, um, <clears throat> but I think so that even from, to how from space, that far, um, I think that refers well, you're not warping so much... space and time yeah. because we know today that space time is one dimension, and so they're they kind of go hand in hand. But can we say? commonplace safe time travel i mean because time travel there's always dangers even on star trek i mean i'm 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 referring specifically to what's the episode where matt fuhrer shows up on the enterprise and everyone is like "Ooh, this is you know he's treated he's from the future right or he's supposed to be from the future he, and... he's from he's from the fu- he's actually not from the future the person who was traveling from the future uh met him and he killed that person and took over his mm. his took like, ship. but he's from the past so he was I actually right. making it yeah so he was making everything up but i think it's right, a matter of they time. Saw that as from the future i mean originally right the, and right. on star trek the original series there was a similar uh character who came in that pod do you remember that white bubble egg pod uh the he time was travel. also playing with time travel, right? He was, but yeah, he again, was, there's, there's danger. Yeah. It's not safe, like the transporter, like a shuttlecraft. It, sure. It's not viewed, but it seems pretty so ubiquitous nonetheless. Like it's it's not the dangerous enough where you're not willing to try because every you know they have this rickety uh, old uh, bird of prey, and Kirk's like, yeah, let's do space time travel. Let's well, he's do reckless. Come on, <laughs> yeah. And and there's no other. I mean, there's. <laughs> You're using John Luke. Okay, the Borg seem pretty confident with their uh, thingy that they created in First Contact. And granted, mm. the Borg don't care about losing ships, you know. And and right, and, but that was a one way trip. I mean, they weren't expecting to come back. No, the Enterprise uses the technology to come back. Yes, the but thing, it's but still the Borg originally had, had intended. Right, but it's still a risk. It's not. Why would why would I they think, why would they time travel in the Delta Quadrant? I think transporters and, are still. And then, and then just I fly. Live in Star Trek future, I still wouldn't use transporters. I'd be a Pulaski. Really? I'd use yeah, transporters, 100%. but I wouldn't. I wouldn't safely want to. Like, I wouldn't want to time travel, um, uh, unless there's like some certainty behind it. Because I, I would be afraid of being stuck in the wrong time. Imagine coming back to the bloody twenty-first century. That would be terrible. 
<laughs> oh, it'd be stuck here. I started a oh. blog, my Star Trek website. There's a short story series I started. I never finished it, but it's about a, a, a like a lieutenant, I think, who gets trapped in this time. I might actually go back to it because oh, now, the thing, now I'm going to make it set it totally during COVID-19 slash... Uh, <laughs> oh, he pops up in 2020, right? Oh, goodness. yeah, he pops up in 2020. So it's gonna be a, <laughs> it's gonna be a doozy that one. But uh, yeah, I would not want to be from the future and get stuck now. Your chances of survival and just happiness would be terrible. But there, but we've also established on Starfleet Boy that there are a ton of time refugees in both directions. Like there are, it seems like to me, time travel wouldn't be the subject of science fiction except for in the same way that we use it they have a different understanding of time travel because we think of it as something that's theoretical. We've never seen an example of actual time travel, whereas I think people in the 23rd and 24th century are more aware of it. Fair enough. Oh, wow. I, I, I guess. Fair enough. I, 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 I do the doctor agree. Is quiet. He's like, the doctor is quiet. He's sitting and he's pondering. I do agree with the doctor, though, in the sense that time travel isn't commonplace like um, like warp drive or like shuttlecrafts or transporting, that kind of stuff. So it, it can be a bit scary. And I think that we see Star Trek and we watch, like, we watch the time travel incidents happen from a Federation Starfleet perspective. And the the regular schmo, right? The um, Andrew living on his planet, his Federation world, uh, you know, going about his day to day life. He's not involved in time travel. He doesn't know anything about that. That's true. Right. right. Yeah. That, that that's mainly what I'm what I'm thinking. Because, I mean, I think in Star Trek you usually see you usually see time travel involved in okay there's an experiment i mean this is it's considered cutting edge experiments right i mean science fiction today uh, often uses stuff that is just out of reach for us correct What's, so what do we yeah. usually see on star trek we see time travel experiments that usually go wrong <laughs> um yeah. we see artificial intelligence that can go wrong um, or it can be amazing like data but well but up until picard data was unique so yeah so i mean in I, most I science think... fiction not just star trek right so i think artificial I think intelligence it's about... also i think of... it focuses on travel to other galaxies they're but... science fiction so this is because this is story -wise. that's the frontier for them. Yeah, I think that's I the don't, frontier. But for is them. that science fiction or is that just you know? It is because it's way out of reach for them. They can't even travel the galaxy in like. But a that's short not a. That, but see, but that's not a. That's not an idea that is wholly out of reach for them. I mean, yeah, certainly I think Voyager sees them going to Delta Quadrant. I mean, they know they can use a... I mean, if they could find a stable wormhole, they could go here, they can go there. I don't know. Exactly. You know the He's distance, talking about maybe like, Andromeda? Learned, yeah, like, we've learned... To, yeah, Andromeda, which Gene Roddenberry actually uh, wrote a whole show about called Andromeda, which I never finished. I don't know. Doctor, did you watch that whole show? Yes, yes, I, I did watch Is it that. a good show? Is it worth watching? Yeah, it's, 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 it's cheesy. It's, you know... <laughs> Wasn't it a bit of the like the ideas that Gene Roddenberry thought didn't fit into the universe of Star Trek? That's what on, I had hoped. On Andromeda? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's not. I would not say it fits into the Star Trek universe at all. Well, I had heard that every time he had an idea that he enjoyed, but but that wouldn't fit the universe of Star Trek, he'd kind of like put it aside and use it for Andromeda. That's what I had heard. Oh, that's neat. Maybe not. It was his. Oh. It was his, uh, it was his way of well, like they doing were, that. They weren't. He was so committed. He was so committed to keeping Star Trek in a certain mold or form. It, it's very interesting. I, I don't I don't think that hit me until now. That's interesting. But they weren't concurrent, though. Andromeda was not concurrent was to fiction it was, it was It was after. Yeah, it was, it was, af it was after. It yeah. was going on during DS9 and Voyager, if I'm not mistaken. Right, but not during Next Generation. Majel Barrett and, and the Sun spearheaded Earth Final Conflict and Andromeda after his death. They said, oh, we found these scripts. Let's see if we can turn mm -hmm. them into shows. Uh, they have elements from previous 
shows that he tried to to do including earth 2 and all that stuff but uh did so, yeah. you guys see the film ad astra yes ad astra ad astra that's with um brad pitt no i wanted to is that it's yeah, it's I, a I, gorgeous I looking movie yeah. and i was I just understand thinking understand why people didn't like it though oh well i was just I, what people didn't like it i didn't know that i think it wasn't very dark, well received i think but i thought uh, it was good um the what i love about it though is that uh you realize it's not much different than how life is right now like how it's depicting life but it's it's i, I was thinking of that concept of like what would be science fiction to star trek people they would have movies like ad astra about uh, a starfleet crew going you know, perhaps like movies and novels about not just even Starfleet crews, maybe civilian crews of all kinds, uh, like going on that long journey, which would be a one way trip, you know, outside of our galaxy, like to go to like Andromeda. That would be an interesting type of like, like adventure slash science fiction idea that I think future people would love. Star what, Trek do you guys, what do you guys think of Dimensions? Yeah, Go, going into like different different yeah. states of of existence. Like we exist as corporeal beings in this kind of space. Maybe a hollow program would have you experience being a non corporeal in like fluidic space. Ooh, and you could do that through a holodeck kind yeah. of experience. Wow. Yeah, I mean, if you look at Q and and they call other... them hollow novels, right? They have they actually novels. Yeah, they call them hollow even... novels. They're like video right. games, basically, that you experience. Maybe like a, maybe yeah. like a movie. This is their interactive movie. They're already a step that. ahead of us because they're experiencing their fiction in general in ways that we don't even experience our fiction. Oh, We're I experience pretty... my Star Trek. <laughs> i do too i put the google glass the google goggles have you guys seen those things i put that on and it feels like you're in a movie theater it makes you dizzy it's great it's probably also it makes you dizzy it's great eyes. yeah it's probably also damaging my eyes but <laughs> i don't like being dizzy so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll. but but you know what the idea of dimensions i i think i think that that's that's a good idea that i think that is probably their idea of if you want to call it science fiction science fantasy um you know when we look at q you know q is obviously something that is beyond our comprehension right mm. um to from from the next generation's point of view uh the idea uh, when he shows up on voyager they have to uh use the civil war as a way for the voyager crew to even understand what's going on in this q continuum in the civil war right, right. so because the they're idea. blowing up planets and stuff. They're blowing up stars. They're making stars go supernova, that kind of stuff. So, like, our small minds wouldn't be able to comprehend the real scale of what's going on. Exactly. Our small minds. So, perhaps science fiction takes a step more towards, I mean, you said earlier Lovecraft. You know, Lovecraft stuff is, is a little more cerebral, and, and, and it's not really focused on tech so much as, say, Jules Verne. Which you know, Jules Verne's stories are, are were very much focused on on the technology that was being used in the stories, and that's what gave it the future futuristic feel. But maybe more like H.G. Wells, where with his stories, it's he doesn't really go into the tech. For example, the time machine. How does the time machine work? The book doesn't really go into it so much as. It's just the idea of traveling through time, of traversing dimensions of time. So I think maybe science fiction in Star Trek is more like that. It's traversing, like you said, dimensions, different existences. Um, I mean, Wesley, you know, the whole thing with the Traveler, uh, whatever he evolves into. I mean, that's certainly, I mean, science fiction to us now, it seems to be science fiction to them i mean it seems to be something extraordinary to them even in the next generation's time uh decker in star trek the motion picture when he merged with with viger the idea of a human merging with the machine uh that seemed extraordinary to them 
And even Ilya, who was, remember the medical sick bay sequence where they're just like marveling at the technology. Mm. She's a synthetic organism. She's like a, a Cylon. You know, I mean, Vija itself. Vija itself yeah. is like exceptional right. to, to them, the way it's evolved. Right. It's right. been transformed. Right. As right. well as, yeah. Yeah. Ilya, to me, I always think, well, she looks so realistic too, but you have to remember she's a synthetic uh being which is in- insane but Ilya's in there she was obviously in there she was able to come out her her the programming that was put on top of her it's a beautiful i i forget how beautiful star and speaking of science fiction <laughs> star trek the motion picture i think is the the only fully science fictiony star trek film everything else becomes science fiction adventure at the very le- least but i feel like i mean even though my heart raced a couple of times it was hardcore science fiction it was like a beautiful <laughs> love letter to uh pure science fiction in a way it, it was wonderful yeah it, it came more from the tradition of 2001 than it did right star trek 2 which is more action-based uh i'll never forget when um and i think I've, I've said the story before i was i was staying up late watching i think it was the flyby of either neptune i think it was neptune or, or Uranus, I don't know. And they had all these NASA people. Uh, it was a live, it was a live flyby of, of the planet. So, of course, you would get like this pixelated image every, I don't know, 15 minutes, and it was black and white, right? And so it, it wasn't that exciting to look at. But all these scientists were like, ooh, ah. And of course, I was up at three in the morning watching this. Uh, live on PBS, and they had, they had all these. Na- they had all the guys from JPL, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. They had Arthur C. Clarke. They had Isaac Asimov, and if I'm not mistaken, they also had Ray Bradbury. And they started. I mean, you because you 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 run out of topics to to say because, like I said, uh, you know, they were getting these images every half hour or whatever. So the they started talking about Star Trek and they ended up agreeing that Star Trek, the motion picture was the best Star Trek movie. And I remember watching it and thinking to myself, they're crazy, but there is a, I love it for a NASA person. And I think a lot of people at NASA, I mean, that movie is the only one except maybe Star Trek five, where it's about exploration, where they're exploring something. But he, even Star Trek Five, you're right. Start. I, I'm glad you gave Star Trek Five the credit, but even Star Trek Five doesn't. <laughs> it kind of right. goes sure. It kind of goes wonky with the, with the action. Like it just goes. Sure. I love it. Don't get me wrong. Star, like Star Trek you know Five has the credit <laughs> of, of it, it, it gets that it gets that extra bonus point because it doesn't just explore space. It also explores spirituality. So I'll, I'll give Star Trek Five some points on that. Um, <laughs> Still not a really competently made like, movie, though. To me, I kind of th- one of the things that I love the most about Star Trek Five is that it's literally William Shatner's vision of Star Trek, and I and I think it's beautiful. Like that, <laughs> that like film is what William Shatner sees Star Trek as, and I think it's great. And I think the motion picture is uh, very commonly classified as what Gene Roddenberry saw Star Trek as. At that yeah. moment, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, you can definitely see. The is next there generation room? tying more into the motion picture than, in, in some ways, than the subsequent movie. So, yeah, I agree is with that. Is there room for Philip K. Dick type uh, fiction in the Star Trek Futures future? Do you have to and, fill me in on that? I, do, I need do androids, I that is. Do androids <laughs> exactly. dream of electric, of electric sheep? sheep. Uh, uh, I think that's. I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, Philip K. Dick. so Sean Tell Philip me. K. Dick is a more modern uh, science fiction author than the other ones that we uh, named. Although, does Arthur C. Clarke still write? He he is still writing, isn't he? Arthur C. Clarke passed away. Oh God, Starfleet boys time traveling. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry to break it to you. <laughs> no, it's true. It's no. I already know. I knew that. I just forgot. <laughs> As soon as you said it, I remembered. 
Jeff Lee, he left you. He left you that pause too. <laughs> <laughs> he he left us in 2008. Um, Jeff Lee Boy is old enough to to where he's seen so much death in his life that he he can't be expected to remember. Oh dear God, he's dead. <sighs> in life. It's true. It's true. <laughs> But Philip K. Dick wrote uh, the most famous thing, do Android's stream of electric sheep uh, that the doctor just mentioned is what became Blade Runner. Oh, okay. So Blade Runner is that story turned into a larger, uh, larger story. And then there's also Johnny Mnemonic, if I'm not mistaken, is his work, right? Philip K. Dick. Johnny Mnemonic. I don't know about that one. No, uh, Philip K. I don't Dick. Think so. Was, the Man in the High Castle, I know, is based on Philip K. Dick, which Philip is K. on Dick, Amazon yeah. Prime. And and so he wrote like I would I would just say dystopian, maybe all of them. <laughs> like they all seem a little dystopian. Uh, future tech novels, and he was I think he created the cyberpunk, or was part of that cyberpunk uh, move, movement that culminated in the movie The ha- Hackers. <laughs> And then it died. <laughs> and then cyber, that movie killed Cyberpunk. <laughs> that killed. <laughs> no, no, I love no. that. Movie, I would it, it Blade Runner. Blade Runner Cyberpunk, isn't it? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, Altered Carbon. Altered Carbon is as well. Altered Carbon. Carbon. Same kind right, of. Vein. That's uh, that's Morgan, right? Robert Morgan, I think. Um, huh? but but yeah, going back to the yeah, go ahead. No, no, go, 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 finish. No, I was gonna say uh, data. You know, when in next generation, you know, when he, when he has dreams, the idea of an art of uh, of an artificial intelligence having dreams, that is something that is is certainly is science. I think I think that's probably something science fictiony to them. I mean, that's something extraordinary, uh, okay. even to data. Um, data. I recently watched uh, rewatched the the documentary that Werner Herzog did about the internet where um he asks the question to several scientists uh does the internet does the internet dream um you know the internet as a whole that question werner Werner herzog Herzog? oh my god that is such a werner herzog question that's so good (laughs) Yeah, he's he's the all uh, does the, monks. the internet dream, <laughs> right? Does the internet dream? Because the internet is kind of you know the question is is the internet going to achieve sentient at some point? Um, so yeah, why, I think why I are not. the monks tweeting? Who why? is praying? <laughs> <laughs> why are the monks that. tweeting? Is my favorite Werner Herzog observation. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just love Werner Herzog. No, yeah, I know that's why I brought him up. But yeah, I think the idea of artificial intelligence and and the idea that they, I mean, artificial inten- intelligence is still something that is unique in in Star Trek. I mean, even in Picard, I mean, you have one planet, um, but that's one planet uh, out of you know thousands or whatever. So. You know that that's still something that is not common to everybody. You know, not everybody has encounters with with sentient artificial intelligence. So I, I think there's probably science fiction that is still written about um, how they will impact society. As we I like st- that as we now, you know, I like that Jean Luc writes books and publishes books. So does Jordy apparently from all good things i think he was writing books uh data most certainly writes books and publishes them um they're all right there was a bunch of there are a bunch of writers <laughs> jordy's the most unimpressed by science fiction uh, novels that come out right he's seen it all with data <laughs> he's just blase about it um i think you go i think you're going in the right direction when you when you talk about how we're kind of i don't know i, I imagine because uh, like Jules Verne, all of that kind of stuff, it, it, science fiction, even today when we watch TV shows and what have you, science fiction is very much about the technology that we're going to have later on. And the technology is almost, it, like it's always, um, I'm going to put this, it, it's not necessarily um, biological. It is very technological. It, it's all metal and wiring and 
screens and what have you. But mm. I like the idea that sometimes Star Trek kind of shows us that there are like sentient or biological ships that exist. Um, Voyager starts using those neural gel packs. And oh, I think yeah. that may, may be in the way they perceive the future as they see it as a much more organic kind of future where instead of necessarily living like living in a big ship which is just a, a a big piece of metal it's it's more like almost like a sentient or it is like a sentient being mm -hmm. and they function it, like a, as in a symbiotic relationship with it it's so weird because on the one hand star trek you know as our being being science fiction that that that's relevant to us in and humanity in our times deals a lot with this uh, idea of like um, you know the Bo I'll just use the Borg as, as an example of like technology being something that could destroy um, uh, sentience period you know like <laughs> or, or or autonomy or whatever you want to call it um, and it, it's just like something that reoccurs over and over in Star Trek yet at the same time, they are creating these like extraordinary leaps in biological um, what it means to be biological because <laughs> like the Dodge Android, for example, is just what is that? <laughs> you know, like she's kind of she's kind of like the answer to to that. And I, I, I think they're going to show Dodge. I, I have a feeling I mean, they could go in this direction. Dodge might be so advanced that she could even reproduce, perhaps, you know, which would be an interesting thing. Oh, I, did I, say Dodge? I meant Soji. Sorry, Do uh, sorry, Soji. <laughs> I meant I meant yeah. Soji, not Dodge. Dodge, Dodge died. Dodge died. <laughs> I love Soji. Like Arthur C. Clarke. <laughs> it's true. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. Starfleet I hope they didn't I'm sure stuff. they didn't die the same way. <laughs> no, no, they didn't. No. Uh, you know what I was thinking? You guys are bringing up the biological with the technological Tin Man. That's the, the yeah, episode. Yeah, yeah. That was. I mean, they. Everyone was. You know, everyone was like, "Oh, we have to acquire this. We have to acquire this." Uh, the idea of, of a more uh, Cronenberg, uh, like technology, where you know, flesh and 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 uh, and technology are, are are merged. You know, biological and 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 t t technology is is more. Uh, merge together. I think that's yeah. You know, that's probably something that they have. They have in their science fiction, and it could be part of. I mean, the idea that might be part of their horror. You know, science fiction kind of dovetails into horror. And you know, you were talking about the Borg. Uh, the idea of of losing your your sense of of self in the technology. Um, you know, there could be a whole subgenre of uh biotech terror or something in, in next generation uh that could be something maybe barkley reads uh and it keeps him up at night there's all these uh biotech <laughs> terror tales <laughs> biotech zombies. so much yeah <laughs> that's really funny yeah it's kind of it's just scared. really interesting i don't know if we're doing a good job of coming up with the future of the future but i like the I like I like thinking about all these connections to science fiction writers. Maybe it's and maybe it's completely um, maybe it's the other way. May, maybe the, the 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 way they view the future is technologyless. <laughs> right, right? Or it's like, right. Oh, or technology could be such that you can just kind of things are bespoke. Um, no, like so, an insurrection. I'm talking about like it's gone. Yeah. Like the the way the the oh. what is it? The, they're living on the Baku. Is it? Um, an insurrection. They live on this planet where they've kind of basically given up all of technology and given up all of the modernisms that they have. As I remember it, though, that what it really was is that the technology was there, but it was just hidden away so that it didn't interfere with your focus. And so they were like, remember at one point she uh, pulls back like this like piece of uh, concrete or something and then there's a, a panel behind it and she enables some kind of technology to protect the village uh, so it's there but it's like it operates in such a way that it doesn't interfere with like you know manual life or whatever like humans work and he, you know and they like they focus on other things there or whatever they are I don't even know if they're humans but <laughs> 
you know, go, going back to time travel, though, I mean, maybe maybe they have a, a lot of stories where people go back in time to a simpler time. I mean, where there is less technology, maybe that's yeah. uh, a common theme in their science fiction where, you know, they get away from it all and kind of like the Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's court, that kind of thing. That's a com- where... I think that's a common theme in life because I would love to go back to like 1982, but <laughs> I think 1982. I would hate it. That's I think very I would specific. Yeah. <laughs> Well, because isn't that when uh, E.T. comes out in 83? Oh my God, no, E.T. E. comes out in 82. 82, so that's uh, the year E.T. comes out. Yeah. So I'd go and watch E.T. as an adult, as a, as a man. <laughs> and so, that's, your, that's your go-to. You can do one time travel, like one jump back, in, back into the past, and you'd go and see E.T. as it comes out. Well, I would go to I would go back to 1982 if I had to be stranded and then help myself to not get killed until I'm able to time travel again. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I might I might even have like knowledge of lottery and lottery numbers and things like that, you know, who knows. <laughs> this is all sounding very back to the futureish now. It is. Uh, mm. Oh, here's a question. Is Back to the Future still relevant in the 24th century? I hope it is. I hope people still love that movie as much as they do now. But I think it would be considered fantasy, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would, I think it would be considered fantasy. Do they have to, do they have to redefine, uh, redefine movie genres or like literature genres later on? Or, or does like certain... Like, does Back to the Future get transferred into fantasy? I think things can things can travel into fantasy if they got it wrong, right? Back to the Future seems to understand temporal mechanics pretty well, so it might be probably listed under something like adventure, uh, vintage sci-fi, or yeah. something like advent, adventure, adventure slash comedy slash vintage sci-fi is what I would think that they would classify it as. That again is very specific. There's a lot of slashes. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, just vintage sci-fi is where I would throw it. I would just throw it into the vintage sci-fi bin. Uh, I like the vintage, vintage comedy. Vintage, <laughs> vintage comedy. Co- exactly. There we go. <laughs> I mean, three hundred years ago stuff is definitely ancient. They even say that actually a lot in TNG when they encounter uh, uh, artifacts from like the eighties or whatever from our time. They say, "Oh, look, I mean, it's ancient." Ancient do we do we listen thing. to a lot of music from 300 years ago? I do. Yeah, he does. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> so you're, that, you're that one guy on the bridge that can point out um, what is what when they find out something from the 80s. You're like, oh, but the, well, even, that's E.T. Let I me tell you love, about it. I even love to just <laughs> listen to like... Uh, uh, it, you know, folk songs in languages I don't understand that are like, you know, five to six hundred years old and, you know, <laughs> Gregorian chants, that, that kind of stuff. So I, I love that kind of music. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> it's all true, by the way. Yeah, that's, I can vouch for yeah. I've tried for years to Humbert's into it a little. Riding in Sohel's car sometimes is quite an experience. <laughs> oh, this is I this is car, car music, is it? Oh the yeah, yeah. chance in the car. In oh the yeah, car. yeah, totally. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like <laughs> this is how I can keep my heart rate under eighty at all times. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! You know, I I, I, I will say I will say that. I, this is actually a really tough topic because I don't think the show, I don't think any of the shows give us a real sense of what they consider to be futuristic or or their science fiction. They the, the all the shows from the original all the way to Picard, you know, when they present, we see a lot of 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 history and and. But we don't see a lot of what they they see looking forward. Well, you because know what it, I mean? it's the Enterprise. A, a, B, C, the D, J, we e, get peaks it of the, it. The J. It's the J. The J. Yeah. I was going through the letters. It's the J. I think they show us the Enterprise J in, in Enterprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that, and I know that they were going for a much more organic feel to the ship. 
I guess if uh, we're fair, as if I guess Star Trek, Star Trek in a way has already taken us to the like not limits because I would think that the imagination is limitless, but to the edge of what we think is possible. It does I would say that this is a great kudos for Star Trek because Star Trek has covered like so much of what we can even envision or imagine as what the distant future is going to be like. So there's still so much that Star Trek um you know shows us that we can't even fathom uh and maybe that's why we can't do a good job of coming up with what their future would be like i see it as a blend of technology and like the 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 navi and their Mm -hmm. symbiotic relationship with the plants and the planet and the you guys remember avatar yeah 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 and how the, the Navi connect that they connect to their uh, flying horses and stuff, but they also connect to the planet's soul almost as if the, like the soul, were, the planet were alive. It has like a nervous system and, mm-hmm. and like almost like a brain or something. Maybe, well, maybe that kind of sentient ego, of the living planet style things. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not up on my Voyager, but it didn't the Voyager. I, I don't know if they, if they actually went through with this on the show, but I know that they had talked about the Voyager having organic parts to it, especially with the engine. I don't know if that ever yeah, came they have through gel, in the show. They have these gel packs. I think they blue. Oh, that you they talked these, about earlier, yeah, right? Blue gel packs um, all throughout bio, the ship. Is that the bio gel packs you're, or whatever you're saying? You're, you're talking about biomimetic, but that's oh. um, that's um, Odo. Oh, that's these right. are just these are just um i think what i think they're just called gel packs but they are uh, like biological um tissue or something yeah the voyager caught a virus or something right like it yeah it it helps connect like it's kind of like uh using fiber optic instead of wires you know uh, so like everything goes faster well this they're using these gel packs because the biological aspect makes the ship run better or smoother or something but then, of course, you get the disadvantage. You can you can catch a virus with that stuff. So, and I think this actually. And I think the Zindi also have, don't their 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 blasters have like an organic component, and I think the Phlox gives it like a, it's this a, a virus. Sick, but... Right. It, it's it's the Zindi. Yeah, mm, it's the Zindi insectoids. I think their ships, and every like everything, their weapons, their ships, everything is kind of like connected the same way mm-hmm. so i guess Enterprise that's... was a wild show i just wish it wasn't set in the past yeah I agree. there's no way around it i really think uh i was watching the expanse again with my mom she didn't see season three and she wanted to see it so we're we're on se- or season four sorry um and i was just like say, like isn't there a way we could just make the expanse in the Star Trek universe, it feels so. It feels so. They don't like have warp drive. Wish. They have stargates. So. <laughs> it's so cool. I love the Expanse. That's that's cutting edge stuff that I love for technology. Like I we I can imagine that that kind of technology being close to uh, realized in my own lifetime because of what we already have. Interestingly, the Expanse to me is barely Minus even the, science the fiction. Gate, the Stargate. No, it's like, 100% science fiction. Yeah, I know, but I think the the Martian is is something that it, it is science, like the the Martian gravity. There's science fiction, yes, but they're so close to even add Astra. It's so close to what what we have. I know we're not exactly going to other planets yet, or going to Mars or whatever, you, but it feels so close to what we have that it's barely science fiction at this point. So, what would you consider it? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. It's then, like a subgenre. Then, until like you sub-genre. figure it out. <laughs> until I figure it out. It's like a futuristic. And futuristic action. I don't know. <laughs> until, until I tweet the academy. Hey, look! I've got a new genre. <laughs> <laughs> Expansive fiction. Uh, Expansive. <laughs> it has you, just to, you just want to put the word expense in there somewhere. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's a good word. Um, I, I 100% uh, 
I I like this discussion a lot. I 100% am going to lobby for uh, what you said earlier, which is that they mostly uh, imagine futures in which it's it's like magic, what what we would consider pure magic, like what the Q do. And their world that they live in would be completely realistic, but probably fabricated in some way, um, uh, which will be interesting. But the technology that does that will be seamless or un, or invisible uh, in in the walls, so to speak. So so here's a question: Is so does Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 still hold up in in the 24th century? I mean, the idea of the monolith and its purpose i mean that certainly seems to still be science fictiony in in their world right and they have but they also have if you i don't know in a way post it becomes fiction true fiction because uh in in star trek we discover and it's it's found out during tng that the the way that uh, there was no monolith. It was actually a people that created seeds and planted them all around. So it wasn't like a monolith in a sense. It was the same concept. But this is no longer science fiction to them because now yeah, they know it's, it's real. Almost, it's almost predictions, isn't it? It's almost like yeah. visionary stuff. But, but I think that... as far as, as as art, yes, it's still on the shelves and it's still widely read 100%. Oh, because the and idea so, that, that Hal, it, I mean, Hal is an artificial intelligence that ascends to a different plane of existence, shall we say, just like Dave Bowman does. Um, I mean, that's certainly still uh, uh, an out there concept, I think, in the 24th century. I would think it still is. I mean, uh, like, yeah, let, let's well, take data. Picard establishes that the only time they were successful in creating that same level of sentience uh or you know being able to like reproduce that is when they used uh you know neuronic whatever cloning it from data himself from fragments of data himself and that's the only way they could do it so synthetic life forms in the future still don't have sentience in the way that hal does or data right. until right. but but all of his offspring do which is interesting like all the people from the the you know the soon planet so Hal is still science fiction. I would say that Hal is. It's hard to say because it's not. He's no longer science fiction, but he's no longer. Data is what they're all focused on. Have you seen the short? Like, these short. No tricks? one cares about Hal because he's not the same level as Data. Data is the next step of Hal. Do you know what no, I mean? But, but remember, Hal is. Uh, he 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 goes beyond just being a computer. He. He ascends so to a different level of. So does data, um, and it's he becomes non corporeal, essentially. Hal. Yeah. So does data. Data becomes. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say that data becomes non corporeal. Data's data's kind of data's memories or data's algorithms are are stored in Some, a computer. Something was haunting Jean Luc, and Jean Luc was dreaming of data, and data was guiding him in the dreams. Oh no 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 no! I don't no no. <laughs> he was just having dreams. You think you yeah, think wait, the wait, dreams? Wait, wait, wait. Yeah, I think the wait dreams. Wait a minute! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Were <laughs> the transcendent data. You're giving back. data too much spiritual, like too much of a spiritual uh, yeah, aspect. I'm, I'm yeah. saying he's he's what he's Hal. He's in the same way that the doctor describes. I think data has transcended uh, his. his and why condition. did he need Picard There's to necessarily no die evidence. to talk to him? He could have just talked to him. Back when he was at the vineyard, There's you can no only see him when you have advanced aromatic syndrome. Oh yes, I see. <laughs> the only oh way you can <laughs> see. <data. laughs> so I'm, I'm right. Hal is still science fiction. Thank you very much. Wait a minute. I was going to talk about the short tricks. Calypso. You guys, you yes. guys. I know that Zavi boy. See, have you seen it? Do you I know what I'm talking it, about. But I know what you're talking about. Okay. Calypso, uh, dudes on the USS Discovery, a thousand years in the future, and the Discovery seems to have developed like an AI. But is it an AI or is it an actual sentience? Because like the the voice and everything that the the computer is doing seems it, it's really it just seemed like a person at this point. 
Mm -hmm. So did, did the USS Discovery computer transcend in the same way? Yeah, I would say so. It, it sounds like it did, that, yeah. 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 So yeah, there, it, there again, yeah. so that that's, okay, that's good evidence of, of what of is... That. Of right. Good job, oh, Sean. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Short tricks. How's irrelevant again? It's... <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, the people that we follow in in our ah. Star Trek, in our current timeline, we'll say around Picard at this point, they don't know anything about the uh, the Calypso short trick. This is just like it, it's the future. It's not even a time travel story. It's just what's happening so far off. Right, right. It's true, but that's that's their science fact, right? Because it's meant to be really what the discovery's like in that yeah. time period. Mm. So, um, <clears throat> interesting. Do you, think, do you think Star Trek will ever actually do that? Just have, let's say, the Enterprise J is is a sentient ship, and you know, well, I would like you the have Enterprise to interact with to the actual that. Enterprise. You have to say Enterprise, da 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 da. You know, I mean, do you think we'll have that one day on a show? I don't know. I don't like the idea of it because it I turns the ships into slaves, doesn't it? Oh, if, if, if they're, they're, they're not sentient. willing, it, that would be. What do you do with a ship that doesn't want to be? Uh, like you know, sonic shower on? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. He's Whoa, God damn right. it! Why? Well, what if it's feeling sick that day? What if the ship <laughs> is called? Does it feel good? Did what if the ship not? finds what, out that? Right? What, what, if what if a fleet of the like? ships get like get destroyed and it's like morning? It's kind. Um, oh my goodness! This actually has been done beautifully, by the way. I should say uh, by the show Doctor Who, oh, uh, the TARDIS, so. which is the Doctor's uh, ship, does actually feel remorse for its kind uh, in a beautiful uh, episode where the TARDIS uh, inhabits the, TARDIS the body is of kind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There are multiple <laughs> Tardises around. Yeah, the the yeah. Tech, the ships that the Time Lords oh, wow. use They're are great. alive, and it's a symbiotic relationship between the Time Lords and their ships. Uh, and 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 when a Time Lord that is assigned a ship dies, the ship dies with him or her. Oh no! It's like the trill. Well, actually, yes. no, because the, tr the trill, yes. the, well, the, trill the, continues. the right. yeah, the oh, trill continues, okay. but the, the, the host dies, but then the, the, right. the slug continues on. The right. TARDIS, to me, successfully holds the title of the most futuristic science fiction concept on on TV. Uh, what the Doctor Who in general, but but the TARDIS itself, that concept is so beautifully uh, depicted on the show over time, and it doesn't. It, not even in the modern show. It starts way long ago in the old show. And, and it's not just the idea of it being alive. It's also the fact that it's uh, it's the idea that it's its own dimension. When you step through right. the two doors, you are stepping into a separate dimension. So it's an it's an infinite right. dimension. It's theorized. in the confines. Yeah. So it's theorized it's, that that the four the, that if you were a fourth dimensional being that you can see the whole of time and space as if it's like an object and that's where the tardis's dimension is that's why it can travel back and forth throughout time and, and so the oh, tardis that just sees blew my mind all, yeah so the tardis sees the the living tardis sees time and space as as a as like a an object and it can go anywhere in the, on on that object at once to or a plane of existence or whatever so doctor who is still science fiction in the 24th yes, century. I, I would doctor so. who I, I, is is hardcore science fiction still it's today. ongoing i think i think and doctor the, who is the, ongoing in the universe of star trek there we go we just figured it out, out. The, <laughs> what the science fiction that the future people in star trek watch is doctor who everyone that's there it we, we just figured it out it is the one show that will endure into the distant future and continue being the future that's extraordinary R How Rafi, on, uh, Rafi on her days off she goes in and and, and pretends to watches be the doctor, doctor who. she does 100 percent. that's what happened <laughs> wow Gary, if you're listening, this was, uh, he's very happy right now. He's probably smiling. <laughs> yeah, probably. 
All right. Now, Sean, you have to get into Doctor Who, clearly. I I eventually will have to watch this Doctor Who, though the Doctor here would tell me not to watch the the modern Doctor Who. Not even even Russell Russell T. Davis? That, that, that's a that's a long discussion. There's not enough time for that. <laughs> I think okay. I think you can start at Russell T Davies. I think he would be okay if you started at the ninth Doctor, and maybe he would encourage you to stop at the tenth or the eleventh. Isn't, isn't there that the eleventh Doctor? No, the eleventh, the first season. Yeah, Perfect he season. would say after the first season of the eleventh Doctor, you don't have to really watch Doctor Who anymore if you don't want to. Yeah, but I don't that, do that. I, I I complete things. You guys know that. So well, you have to start with 1963 no. and an earthly child. Yes. Let's just go 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 from there. Go forth. The Doctor and I, a plug for things that don't exist anymore, but time travelers, you can go back in time and listen to it. But the Doctor and I, uh, you did a podcast. We made it through one episode called an unearthly podcast. It was about Doctor Who. You're plugging uh, this show, but but it's not uploaded anywhere. No, it's nowhere yet. It's, it no, doesn't exist it doesn't anymore. Exist. Oh, it no. did. You don't even have it archived somewhere? I'm sure it's somewhere. That's what I'm saying. Time travelers can go back and listen to it. Right. People <laughs> in the they... future who are listening to this to this podcast who because have track time chat travel will ability endure. can just, yeah. Track chat will endure into the fu- The people who are actually in the Star Trek future that we dream about, they're listening to Trek chat. So we're saying hello from the distant past, from ancient hello. times. Hello. 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 hello, 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 hello. It's, it's hello. shit back here. Don't come back. <laughs> stay where you are. Yeah, right. Help, no, stay, actually, come save us. Are. Bring us. Come save the... us. Yeah. yeah. Come bring us. No, because then they won't have any more trick chats. They'll alter the past. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's about it, I think. Um, what do you guys think, or oh, listeners? Uh, about the future of the future how do how do the people in star trek envision the future leave a comment uh thank you so much for listening thank you so much guys for coming on it's thank always great having, having you us. thank you it was really fun a really yeah. fun discussion it was awesome and uh that's about it live long and prosper